Senator Bernie Sanders has made it clear that while his path to the nomination may be narrow, he is not backing out of the race yet. What I have said from day one is I will do everything uh, I can to defeat Donald Trump, who I think is the most dangerous president uh, in the modern history of this country. And I think his performance in terms of the coronavirus uh, pandemic only bears that out. But we do live in a democracy. People do have the right to vote. And I think especially now, given the unprecedented crisis that we're in, uh, it is important to talk about the best way to go forward. I think that debate is is very important. So how did things get to this point? HuffPost political reporter Daniel Marins, you recently wrote about the campaign surge and then its failure to close the deal. Daniel joins us now via Skype with his analysis. Great to see you, Dan. How are you? Great to be here. Absolutely. Dan, tell us a little about top line takeaways from your kind of postmortem in the Bernie campaign. What went wrong for Bernie Sanders? Why couldn't he close the deal whenever it mattered? So if I were to point to just a couple different themes here, one of them is that Sanders has always been sort of skeptical of traditional campaign tools, things like polling, using that polling to emphasize particular kinds of messages to particular groups of people. He's been skeptical of going on the attack, and he was certainly very reluctant to go on the attack against Joe Biden. Uh, He is very sensitive to the fact that poor and working class people fund his campaign in small increments, but that sometimes leaves him erring on the side of not spending enough money and sometimes uh, not uh, too much. And and of course, there there's the fact that uh, he, he, rel- he staffed his team this time around even more so than last time around with people who are relatively new to the political campaign experience. Some people feel that they were not assertive enough in challenging the senator's instincts. And finally, when he was riding high, he did not pivot to sort of welcome in the larger Democratic Party hmm. and and uh, stop railing against the establishment. He didn't craft. Uh, in, in fact, he got bogged down in a week of negative stories about his sort of nuanced praise for uh, Cuban uh, dictator Fidel Castro. Now, all of these things in and of themselves, I just want to clarify, I have no idea whether any of this would have made a major difference in Bernie Sanders's campaign. I, I just wanted to point out that all else being equal, these were things that many people in the campaign were urging him to consider, uh, to consider the idea that the moderates might consolidate. He never had a plan for that. Mm. Um, and, 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 to, and to employ different strategies to, to boost his numbers and broaden his coalition. He didn't really execute on, on any one of those strategies uh, in, in, in their fullest. Well, and there was this moment, and you have some great inside the campaign reporting on this. There's this moment after Nevada, right, when Bernie has got won the popular vote in all three of the first um, three, uh, all three of the first states, and Joe is looking very, very weak. And there's a need to sort of really take him out, right? This is clearly your main challenger. And there were factions within the campaign who were pushing him to be more aggressive against Joe Biden. Just take us inside some of those moments when people are trying to make the case to Bernie that he needs to be more aggressive. They even thought that they had convinced him that he needs to challenge Joe more aggressively. But at the last minute, he would always pull back and fail to fail to land the punches. Yeah, this was actually the the anecdote that I lead with is actually from September. Um, There was there was uh, David Sirota, a speechwriter and a pollster for the campaign, Ben Tolchin. There had been a rally in Denver uh, earlier in the week before the September debate. And uh, these were figures, again, normally in a campaign, figures with those titles might feel like they have an audience with the candidate or at least people close to the candidate. They felt apparently like they were having trouble getting their message through. They drafted a memo on the need for clear and more consistent contrast with Joe Biden. And they actually got Nina Turner and Jeff Weaver on board with that memo, but they weren't able to get an audience with the senator himself. And so they drove up and sort of crashed a debate prep session in Boulder, Colorado, demanded an audience, sort of insisted that in that September debate in Houston, and again, this was at a time when Bernie was really struggling, Warren was actually sort of surging, and it would, it would, it would just be a couple weeks before his heart attack. And they thought they had convinced him. Now, other aides who were in the room before they came and who are really in Sanders' closer inner circle actually said that those folks 
uh, had a discouraging effect on Bernie. But either way, no one was able to prevail on him in that. And he went with his standard opening statement about oligarchy. Uh, another anecdote related to that, ahead of the June debate, people wrote for in his opening statement uh, a, a, a critique of Joe Biden for the line, nothing will fundamentally change, that Joe Biden had said in a fundraiser. And and basically, that that line was something that Bernie never hit on. And of course, he didn't end up going on the attack against Biden on the air uh, until the day after Super Tuesday, when most people think it was already too late. Yeah, Dan, I mean, it strikes me reading the piece and kind of all the inside factions. I don't think it's any one faction. I think the problem was Bernie. I think Bernie himself never fundamentally understood how to actually win and that you have to draw real contrast with somebody who you might, you know, call your friend. I mean, was there a real frustration in the campaign at Bernie himself for not fulfilling this movement? I think there's I think there's just this kind of sense of of yeah frustration maybe maybe uh, sort of shoulder shrugging this is who he is is something I heard a lot off record from people we were never going to get him to be able to stop railing against the establishment even when he was a front runner these were things that that aides said nobody really I mean there was some finger pointing at the fact that in the past there were figures who were really able to confront Bernie. And, and figures like Tad Devon and Mark Longabaugh, who Bernie had a falling out with, um, and, and, and frankly, Jeff Weaver as well. And Bernie replaced them effectively with people who, for better or worse, you know, didn't have that comfort level with him of, of years of working with him and also were more acclimated to the Capitol Hill environment than the, than the campaign environment. But I think, I think one thing, you know, about, about this sort of conflict within Bernie is that there have been times when he has sought to be strategic in his career, I, I believe, you know, running for mayor, running for Congress. But he has this idea in his head that he's only ever gotten to where he is by being his fully unbridled, authentic movement self. There is no left wing position that is too far left. There is no rhetoric that is too bombastic. And there is no uh, sort of technocratic style campaign tool that is um consequential that has any real importance here i don't think that i mean he, he he i think he appreciates social media he appreciates digital fundraising the other stuff he lets other people handle it but if if it crosses his own comfort level in terms of things that he is comfortable doing whether it's contrast with biden whether it's tailoring his own rhetoric whether it's making phone calls to his fellow lawmakers for endorsements something he's deeply uncomfortable doing he ends up siding with what's more comfortable and i think the thing that leftists will have to ask themselves is whether it's enough to just be an authentic movement person or if sometimes strategy, tactics and delegating to people who have records of winning and consulting in this field matters. Well, it's something we've been talking about here. You have to be serious about power. Right. And so what I like about your piece and you writing it because you actually, first of all, covered his campaign fairly and also, you know, have a real understanding of the inner workings there is that. Most of the mainstream press would find it farcical that the problem in the campaign was that he wasn't aggressive or bombastic enough, or at least that one of the problems was that, because there's such a caricature of, oh, he's so mean, he's so nasty, he's so aggressive, et cetera. But no, actually, when it came down to it, he couldn't get the job done because he wasn't willing to really hit his friend, Joe Biden. And so to me, that's, you know, that's kind of ironic that it's the exact opposite of the portrayal from the mainstream media. But but the other thing that you're getting at here is the paradox of it's true. Him just doing his thing is exactly why so many people love him so much and why millions, the record breaking number of people donated to his campaign, organized for his campaign, volunteered, why there was such um, enthusiasm and, you know, and love for him as a person, not to mention his ideas. But when it came down to it and he actually had to adjust that approach in order to move from that 30% number to a 40 or a 50% number, he wasn't able to, to ultimately, you know, maneuver in that way to get it done. Yeah. And I think one of the stories that he told himself and a lot of his activists told themselves was that he didn't really need to change or accommodate or target. He already had his 46% from last time. And there was this untapped block of young, progressive, and working class voters who vote infrequently, 
who would flock to him. Now, there are some precedents for this, namely Obama in 2008. Um, actually, Ayanna Presley Jews turn out in her Boston primary. Hmm. There are a couple of cases for it, um, often in much smaller primaries. But it's a very, very, very hard thing to do. Now, I'm told by people who were operating, you know, on, you know, whether it's um, getting the message out in the field or getting it out over the airwaves, that the campaign actually was trying to do persuasion. But when the top line message coming from Bernie is, I'm electable, and my electability argument is that I will turn out unprecedented numbers of people, and I therefore don't need to compromise my message. I don't even need to tailor my message because this is why people love me. Uh, it, it 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 makes it hard. It makes it hard when that doesn't come to be come to be true. Because as we've seen, even in cases where youth turnout did go up, in let's say Texas and Virginia, older turnout went up even more. So again, the, there right. were a couple different stories being told here. That, that were uh, intended to sort of, um, you know, uh, I guess, justify this approach. And in the end, there wasn't really a unified strategy. I mean, right. could, could, so. No, I think you're right. I think they had an arrogant and frankly wrong theory of the case and had no nimble ability to adjust and had just bad assumptions. That's really what it all came down to. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Really great piece. I encourage everybody. Yeah, great to reporting, read. Dan. Thank you. Great to be here. Mm -hmm. Next on Rising, Harvard University economic policy professor Jason Furman on the good, the bad, and the ugly of the economic stimulus package. What should come next? Stay tuned.